screen. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thanks for joining our webinar today discussing a different approach to SSL inspection. I'm delighted to be joined today by Andy Kennedy, who is the Sales Engineering Manager at Bytes New Partners at Scala. Um, today we're going to be looking at some of the reasons why SSL inspection is increasingly um, necessary and important within the security landscape and looking at a new approach to SSL inspection from Bedscaler. So just to give you a very quick agenda for today. Uh, so I'm going to have a little bit of housekeeping, um, look at who Bytes are, I will keep it very brief introduction to Bytes, most of you know it already. Introduce Andy Kennedy and Bedscaler and then hand over to Andy who will take us through the bulk of today's presentation around how SSL creates security blind spots and how security teams can counteract that. Um, so housekeeping, we've got attendee lines on mute throughout the presentation, however we do welcome questions and encourage you to, as they occur to you throughout Andy's presentation, please do post the questions that, you, that occur via the chat or the questions box and I will run an interactive Q&A with Andy at the end. Um, for the purpose of today's webinar, we will keep the discussions today to strategic and solution discussions. So we won't be discussing commercials. Um, on this particular session, though of course we're well, those conversations are welcome with your Bytes account manager post-webinar. There will be a recording available post the session and there's a feedback survey at the end. So we encourage you to fill that in so we can continue to make sure that these um, informative webinars hit the mark. So a little bit about Bytes, who are we? So we are a security specialist reseller within the multi-billion bytes Allied Electronics Group, the Altron Group. We've been focusing on network security for over 16 years and on purchase, um, purchased by the Bytes Group, they've kept us as an independent security specialist so that we can continue to provide expertise and consultancy within the network security arena. We have a full consultancy and in-house support team of um, director engineer, escalation engineers, and we, um, because of that, we enjoy top tier vendor status with um, many different partners such as Zscaler, we're a platinum partner of Forcepoint, Forcedar Elite partner of Checkpoint, and that allows us to deliver a high degree of technical insight around solutions as well as commercial value on those. So where do we work? We um, work across network security, looking at endpoint, next generation firewalls, um, content security, specifically web security, which we're talking about with you today, uh, data security, access, and mobile security. So we're a broad spectrum of the security landscape we work with different partners within. Within those, um, what banks do is we um, have a variety of different technical services which we wrap around those solutions in order to make sure that customers are maximizing the value from those. So we have um, technology delivery, installation and maintenance services. We are involved in security strategy development, technology mapping, and also planning and delivery. And so we are able to provide insight in a variety of different technical areas for our customers. So over to today's session, um, why do we need a new approach to SSL inspection? So the amount of encrypted traffic is growing. Um, estimates currently suggest up to about 80% of global internet traffic is SSL encrypt encrypted. Um, what does that do? Um, so within, with the aim of making our online lives more secure, we actually create security blind spots behind SSL encryption, which hackers can manipulate and use to hide network nasties, botnet connections, malware, etc., etc. And because the majority of the firewalls aren't designed to decrypt SSL, a lot of net new threats are actually shrouded and masked by SSL, um, leaving network security teams and businesses vulnerable to those threats. Um, firewalls um, are not designed to decrypt SSL. They have SSL decryption functionality. However, when they are um, tasked with decrypting all SSL traffic, they fall over and have performance issues. So there is a need for a new approach. Um, you can go down the appliance route, and there are dedicated SSL decryption appliances out there, but they are cost and require management um, and installing very different appliances to encrypt 
decrypt SSL traffic can be a very costly and complex approach. So that's why by um, working with new partners at Scala as they look at a cloud-based, cloud-first approach to SSL decryption. With that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Andy Kennedy. Andy is a security engineer manager at Zscaler. Um, Zscaler are a web security company which has a cloud-first strategy. It's a cloud-based web security company where they offer cloud security as a service. Uh, they protect more than 50 million users worldwide, and they're working with more than 5,000 enterprises globally on how to maximize their cloud first strategy and ensure security um, in flexible and cost effective ways. So with that in mind, I'll ha say no more, hand over to Andy, um, who'll take you through how you can decrypt and look at SSL traffic in a different manner. Thank you. And thank you very much, Shona. And I would love to uh, extend uh, my welcome to all the folks that have joined us on this morning's webinar. And I guess thank you both to, to yourself, Sean and Bates, uh, for allowing us the opportunity to participate in, in today's um, webinar. So just before we get started, um, maybe just to confirm, uh, Shona, for me that uh, you can indeed see uh, the presentation this morning. I can indeed. If you pop that on full screen, then we'll um, be able to see. That's perfect. Lovely. I'm going to mute myself right now to avoid any feedback. I'll leave you to it. I'll pop back on at the end to do the Q&A. Lovely. So as a way of introduction, and maybe just extend on what Shona mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, for those of you not familiar with Zscaler, uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a high-level overview of, of what Zscaler does and what we help try and address for our customers when it comes to some of their business and IT outcomes that they hope to accomplish. And then what we'll do is we'll explore a little bit about some of the challenges that Shona referred to, particularly around uh, the use of encryption as a broad way of, um, just actually one moment, uh, Shona, we're just getting a little bit of noise on the background there, so we just want to uh, uh, mute if possible. Uh, so use of SSL uh, predominantly within uh, EMEA and also worldwide uh, to encrypt communications and secure communications to the internet. And we'll talk a little bit about um, how that's done and then how Zedgiller can help ensure that you're safe and secure even though you may be using encryption uh, as the transport. So as a way of introduction to Zedgiller then, um, really if I had to try and summarize what we do, uh, it's about delivering a suite of cybersecurity defense controls but it's actually delivering it as a cloud service. Uh, and really, the latter part of that sentence you know, is the clue to why Zedgiller is a little bit different to what many of you may have uh, come across before. And specifically, it's the way that Zedgiller provides a number of these cybersecurity controls, and we'll talk about what those are in a moment. But because it's delivered as a cloud service, means that you don't have to deploy any hardware. You may not even have to deploy any software but yet you can still take advantage of many of the, the controls and uh, defense techniques that one needs to put in place in order to be safe and secure when you use the internet. So coming back to those business and IT outcomes, uh, then predominantly they actually sit across three main pillars. Uh, the first being around access control. And Zedgiller as a company has actually been around for uh, the best part of nine years. Uh, and predominantly it was originally focused on uh, ensuring that companies could things like deploy and enforce an acceptable use policy for their employees. And that would make sure that users didn't go to inappropriate content on the internet. It would make sure that people didn't go to sites that might host uh, copyright infringement material, and really just made sure that there was a, a very high level uh, set of access control for employees going to the internet to make sure that they remained using the internet for business purposes. However, obviously things that have expanded since then in terms of the threats that exist over the internet, but also the way that we consume applications today. So as we look at the organization's enterprise IT strategies, we have seen a, a, an introduction of new cloud-based services, whether it be Office 365, but also other services that one may not even know employees are actually using. And particularly this term is known as shadow IT. 
And again, um, Zscaler has really been focused at trying to introduce cloud application security broker functionality to make sure that we can identify when people are using services such as Evernote, Dropbox, uh, Box, etc., where you might be hosting content, but you may not actually have that as a, a sanctioned IT service. So again, helping not only enforce the acceptable use policy, but then complement the fact that we can also give you visibility into what applications and services are being consumed over the internet was the second kind of pillar of the access control function. However, as we mentioned, Office 365 and other services are becoming a cornerstone now of organizations' IT. And in order to be able to consume those services, uh, it's actually forcing a transformation in the network topologies that we see organizations adopt and deploy today. In particular, that's around moving away from the legacy models of having to backhaul traffic over, say, legacy MPLS VPN platforms in order to have a centralized security processing function where you could do things like firewall functionality, uh, proxies, VLP inspection. All of that functionality, which typically has been de delivered in an appliance format, Today, if you adopt Office 365 and software as a service, then often what is encouraged is to have local internet breakout from remote offices, for instance, or from road warriors. Having that direct internet access is very important because in order to have a great Office 365 experience, we basically need to get that traffic as quickly as possible into the Microsoft Cloud. And again, Zscaler has been doing a lot of work in this space to help optimize not only the performance of those applications and ensure organizations can move to a local internet breakout model, but also the fact that we can make sure that's done in a safe way and in a, a performant manner by doing things like bandwidth control, making sure, for example, YouTube or Netflix traffic doesn't impede uh, those business critical applications. So really that comes down to the IT resource management part at the bottom of the picture, which is around how we make sure that people we use the internet for what it's intended. And for example, we don't have that internet resource, which is quite a costly and expensive service being consumed by, say, Netflix, which might not necessarily have any business purpose within your, your company. But of course, it's not just around access control. Uh, one point is getting to the internet and making sure people go to the right content way. But also, as we, we have seen time and time again, that we see a number of threats and exploits conducted even from allowed or permitted sites. And there it's really moving into you know, the, the security model around how do we make sure that even when you're going to allow content, allow sites, that we make sure that we still are not being exploited or we are still not vulnerable to attacks through those channels. And really it's around cyber risk management. So as an IT organization, obviously as the fact that you're allowing your users access to the internet there's already a negotiation of a risk uh, when people use the internet because, of course, uh, they are susceptible to cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. They're susceptible to be redirected to where they don't want to go. Potentially, they could be downloading files or content that are infected by malware or ransomware. So really, it's about helping manage that risk. And, and Zscaler has put in a number of cyber defense controls, um, whether it be around advanced threat protection, whether it be around technologies such as cloud sandboxing, where we can detonate files before they're delivered to the end user. All of those capabilities allow us to manage um, the organization's reputational risk, because of course, uh, if your organization can't function because it's protected by ransomware, we can help block and defend against those types of, of exploits and vulnerabilities. But also, we can also manage the cost around having to, for example, clean up end users' devices if they should be infected by malware or they should be infected by viruses or trojans. And again, uh, we're helping organizations manage with that, that risk. And lastly, as we, we see um, governance and compliance have an ever-increasing uh, role to play in that cyber risk posture, um, then clearly part of that is trying to manage and make sure that the workflow of employees doesn't result in accidental or intentional data loss. Uh, as we have seen time and time again in the headlines in the newspapers and on the online news websites, uh, we see um, large significant data breaches occurring whereby data is lost in an organization. Is there a way, for example, to introduce things like data loss prevention and protection to ensure the end users don't accidentally lose data through uh, malware inf infections? And again, our cyber risk controls help uh, protect and mitigate that, but also making sure the end users aren't using services such as Gmail or Hotmail to send files and potentially um, 
information that's sent out to an organization over their personal email, for instance. And again, making sure those web channels are not used as a, a channel for communication for the exfiltration of that data. So Zscaler does this through a, a cloud platform. And indeed, uh, in order for us to accomplish that, we have a global data plane footprint that exists in 100 data centers worldwide. Uh, just to give you an indication of scale, uh, we're dealing with somewhere in the region of 30 billion transactions every day. Uh, indeed, our peak was actually in the inauguration of Donald Trump at the early part of this year, uh, where we exceeded that 30 billion number. Um, to give you a feel for, for what that means, um, Google transacts somewhere in about 3.5 billion. So to give you an idea, it's almost 10 times as much as, uh, as Google are dealing with on a daily basis in terms of the number of searches that they deal with. And then, of course, uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, we actually see somewhere in the region of about 125 million threats being blocked every day by the platform. So again, um, just gives you an indication of just the, the level of activity that's out there by uh, malicious actors. And again, uh, we, we see that whether it be you know simple blocks of um, content that might be infected with a, a virus, all the way through to very sophisticated zero-day uh, attacks. And in order to protect against that, we, we have to push some of the reason about 120,000 uh, security updates every single day uh, in order to protect against those threats. So those are the, the key kind of business use cases that Zscaler tries to address. Uh, this is all actually complemented by a set of um, technical features that sit behind those capabilities. So, you know, around access control, maybe cloud firewalling, uh, and again, Zscaler is a next-gen firewall. So looking into, for example, the, the content type, not just the, the port and protocol number, whether it be around looking into the web transactions and making sure that we don't just allow or deny based on the URL or domain, but also we're looking at actually the content itself. So looking into the JavaScript, looking into the objects that are actually delivered down to the end user. And then we talked about IT resource management. Some of that will be around bandwidth control, uh, making sure that, for instance, uh, that we prioritize business apps over um, maybe consumer apps. And then, of course, all of the, the security functionality that we refer to is delivered through uh, many of the, the, the concepts that you might be familiar with that have been delivered previously through an appliance format, but now being delivered as a cloud service. So that could be around antivirus, anti-malware. It may also be around sandboxing technologies, again, where we detonate a file before it's delivered to the end user to detect what kind of behavior that file may conduct. Uh, or whether it be looking into, for example, detecting anonymizers, um, such as the onion router, or looking to detect things like zero pixel iframes, which might be used as a conduit to redirect a user out to a particular site that they didn't want to go to. And then lastly, we, we mentioned data protection. Um, a lot of that's around, for example, cloud application security broker functionality, some of which we'll show today, along with you know simple protection mechanisms uh, that might exist from you know, blocking executable files to non-IT users, all the way through to uh, more sophisticated data loss prevention, where we can identify things like social security numbers or credit card numbers, etc. Now, a key point to this is that uh, in order for us to accomplish um, providing all of these cybersecurity defense controls, is we have to do this in a way that's not typically done uh, or has never been possible before through an appliance format. Now, to give you an idea, today we actually provide all this functionality in our cloud in a way that basically scans every single um, byte outbound and every single byte inbound from a, a web interaction or web transaction. And the benefit of that is, is that we can then look inside that payload, we can analyze and identify the threats that may exist with that content. But of course, when we're coming to modern uh, web applications and web services, and indeed with the prevalence and the uh, the, the mass uh, adoption of encryption, then clearly that can lead to, shall we say, a blind spot in IT defense. And in order to, for us to be able to ensure that we can maintain the security posture that a company may need to uh, enforce and maintain, then we need to be able to look into that SSL content. And that's really going to be where we're going to focus at the bulk of our time this morning. So just to kind of summarize, I mean, Zscaler, our, our key principle really is to make sure that you have a consistent security policy and posture irrespective of whether you're in the largest office in your organization or whether you're in the smallest office or alternatively if you're out on the road traveling in a hotspot or a coffee shop or an airport, making sure that all of these controls and defenses will be applicable to your users so that you do not have a weak uh, defenses 
just because a user happens to be outside the umbrella or perimeter of your appliance-based uh, security defenses. So if that's what Zezgal tries to do, how do we do that when we have SSL in the mix? Well, if we look at the, the broad stats, and, and Shona made reference to this earlier, uh, but this is an article from Wired, and, and we'll share the link to the actual article itself. Um, but in general, they were making a, a, an article and, and some analysis around the fact that half the web is actually now encrypted. And there was a conversation and a dialogue really around how this might make end users safer. Um, however, there are actually a, a number of different opinions on this topic. Um, as we begin to see, for example, uh, certificates that are used um, to allow organizations to deploy SSL or TLS on a website, and those certificates are now free. Um, it means that we're reducing a lot of the, the original obstacles to using encryption actually for day-to-day -day, uh, web transactions. And then in particular, uh, if uh, you know, a malicious actor uh, wishes to um, spend their time developing a zero-day uh, attack or they wish to try and have people tricked into downloading malicious content as part of an exploit kit, then the reality is, is that they're not going to go to that effort and not use uh, a free certificate to encrypt that traffic. Um, because they're investing their time, they're looking at a return on investment on their energy and effort they put into those attacks. So when they, it comes to that uh, type of, of thought process, then really a lot of the, the malicious traffic will be served over encrypted channels. And indeed, if we look at uh, today in EMEA in particular, um, there's actually a great report produced by a company called Sandvine. They make a lot of the, the network analysis probes that go into both fixed and mobile networks. You actually see that the majority of traffic in EMEA is actually now served over encrypted channels. In particular, if you look at com uh, countries such as Germany, the numbers and the statistics are actually even higher. And again, the key point here is, is the fact that if you wish to have a robust security posture, then we need to be able to look into that traffic. And the reason why is because uh, we, we, we did some analysis on the traffic that we see within the Zscaler cloud. Now, we actually service somewhere in the region of uh, 50 million users uh, across 5,000 different organizations who use the Zscaler cloud as their security platform uh, to provide protection for all users and devices when they interact with the internet. And based on our analysis, we saw somewhere in the region of about 600,000 malicious activities each and every day which was actually delivered using SSL as, as the communications vector uh, over which those malicious uh, transactions were actually occurring. And, and that can reach from um, exploit kit traffic, through malware uh, downloads, through adware distribution. Uh, and indeed, we were seeing peaks in the region of about 2 million different transactions every single day uh, using SSL uh, that were deemed to be malicious. Now, when we drill down on this, uh, you will see uh, one example being exploit kits, which actually are the, the tools and techniques that are used uh, often to try and download malware into an organization or download ransomware into an organization as part of a targeted attack. And if we begin to drill down those numbers from that peak of 2 million down to the 600,000 on average, we see somewhere in the region around 10,000 hits per month are actually um, web exploits that are actually using SSL as part of the infection chain. So this basically means that they're using SSL communications in order to be able to do that infection on the endpoint. And indeed, if we begin to look at then um, other um, maybe metrics that we've been able to uh, correlate, that we also see other mechanisms for bringing malware into an organization. It could be through email, it could be through USB sticks. So when that malware actually tries to make a communication back out, over the internet to maybe a command and control infrastructure, then we're seeing some of the region of around 1,500 to 2,000 um, callbacks over SSL back out to those uh, web servers that are compromised or potentially hosting uh, that malicious payload that will ultimately be used maybe to direct that endpoint to either exfiltrate information in the case of maybe a, a point of sale uh, compromise or maybe to download additional information to that endpoint, maybe to capture data. And if that endpoint happens to be a mobile device, as we have seen, for example, in fake Netflix applications or other types of remote access trojans, then it might be exfiltrating things like pictures from your phone. It might be sending information around SMS messages that you have on your phone. It might enable things like cameras 
or microphones on those endpoints as well. So again, the fact that those command and control connections are being used, clearly um, people want, and those people who are using these tools, want to ensure that that communication is encrypted. Principally because for most organizations today, because of the cost and the implications of having to do that SSL encryption and decryption, means that they're actually bypassing a lot of that traffic, particularly for allowed sites. And again, it's very important because there is this perception that, well, this traffic's just going to bad sites, so can't we just use access control to block it? Unfortunately, the answer is no, because for a lot of the time, these sites are actually hosted over content delivery networks. Um, so for example, could you as an organization function and, uh, and consume services if you block, for example, Akamai or you block, block uh, Microsoft or you block Amazon as a target for that content? And the answer is probably no, you wouldn't be able to, to function if you block those sources. So because it's coming over those trusted sources and it's coming over SSL, a lot of organizations are bypassing that traffic and ultimately that can lead uh, to a source of infection. So as organizations try to, to manage this, um, one, one of the things we do see is that, uh, broadly speaking, um, we will see a number of different mechanisms that are deployed to try and protect against these, these attack vectors. And the first is, is to try and deploy appliances and then increase the performance of those appliances in order to accommodate the overhead, I guess, associated with encryption. However, error analysis and based on information that's publicly available, then we are seeing somewhere in the region of, of an overhead of up to eight times in terms of the capacity and the performance required on those appliances in order to be able to uh, provide that function. So if we think about what that actually means, it basically means that today you're getting the same functionality, but you're having to deploy eight times as much in order to keep up with the fact that you're trying to look into those SSL communication flows. You're not actually adding any additional functionality per se. You're not even necessarily getting any further performance, but you're having to invest up to eight times more to get that, that capability. So as a cloud platform, one of the things Zscaler does is actually take that burden away from our end users. So Zscaler itself has economy of scale because we're dealing with those 50 million users across 5,000 different organizations and 100 different data centers. We actually have a pool and a, of capacity that can accommodate and can actually allow us to do SSL um, inspection without having to place the burden back on the user to do the capacity management the dimensioning, and also accommodating those peaks. So the kind of statistical multiplexing gain that you get from the fact you have all of these users using a common platform or a shared platform means that you can help users, um, allow them to introduce the, the SSL interception that's required, but not necessarily be uh, burdened with having to do the management of that infrastructure, because again, it's delivered as a cloud service. So we've talked a little bit about the challenges. We've talked a little bit about some of the threats that we see, um, but what does that actually look like from a real world practical perspective? How do we protect and how do we make sure that we enforce policy and maintain a consistent security posture uh, when we're using SSL communication flows? And what we're gonna do now is just jump into a little bit of a demo just to kind of show you what this actually means in, in practice and reality. So let me just yes, pause for one moment. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into the browser and I'm going to allow us to share a little bit of content. So Shona, if you're still on the line, I just want to just double check that you can see my browser and that this content is showing correctly. Yes, it's um, all clear. I see web overview and your cloud application classes, top URL categories, etc. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So. What we're showing here is, in effect, uh, the Zscaler Administration Console. So uh, to give you an idea, if you were to subscribe to the Zscaler service, you would be basically be granted an instance in the Zscaler cloud. And that would provide all of the functionality that we have described in the previous slides. So what you can see is effectively a number of tabs along the top. Uh, some will be around, for example, uh, analytics around how the web is being used in your organization. It could be around security. It could be around, for example, cloud applications, providing insight into what applications have been used by your company, giving you a view of, for example, what's happening within the organization uh, when it comes to how the web is actually being consumed. 
Um, but we're going to spend a little bit of time then uh, this morning talking about um, application control and talking about how we do SSL inspection. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly go to a website and just make sure we can get to that website. So if I go to the BBC website, um, then what we'll do is we'll load up the BBC. I'm just using internet as normal. We're looking at the internet. Uh, fantastic. Uh, but let's now go to a website where actually there is SSL in use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into uh, Gmail. So as you begin to log into Gmail, a um, couple of points to note. If I click on the little padlock icon, uh, you will see the first thing is that the actual the account itself and the SSL transaction is actually verified by Zscaler. So this is the first clue that we're doing SSL inspection. And we'll talk a little bit about how this policy is actually enforced. But if I click down and do more information, I can actually look into the actual certificate itself, um, and I can see the information that's actually provided by Zscaler. You'll see effectively what we're doing is we're actually acting as an intermediate root certificate authority. So to give you an idea of what's actually occurring in the background is that my browser effectively has the certificate installed, uh, which allows me as a browser to trust Zscaler um, as a target. And the reason why that's a target is because I'm actually sending my traffic via the Zscaler cloud, uh, and that can be done through a number of ways, maybe using a, a proxy or a configuration file or using an application, for instance. Now, because I trust Zscaler and because I've got that certificate, what it's allowed me to do is when I go to Google, uh, what it's actually doing is, is, is my request arrives at the Zscaler cloud. The Zscaler cloud is then acting as a proxy on my behalf to then further make a, an encrypted communications uh, connection out towards the, the Gmail servers. So effectively, I still have end-to-end -end encryption from my browser or from my, my device all the way through to, to Google. But in the middle, there is this trusted uh, counterparty, Zscaler, which is actually looking into that communications flow. And what it's doing is inspecting every single byte that's both sent in terms of my GET requests and every response that I get back from Google in terms of the, uh, the actual response from Google in terms of its uh, transaction. And what we'll be able to see is, for example, um, we can look into that communication flow to identify any threats, but also to apply policy that we may wish to apply. So let me just uh, log in then as a user, um, and we'll have a look at what happens next. So as you can see, the user actually isn't actually aware at this moment that there is anything occurring other than the fact that we have uh, um, we have actually uh, clicked on that padlock to see that uh, this transaction has been protected by, by Zscaler. But I'm now in my, my inbox. I'm now in my, my content. So before we, we kind of show you what the end user experience is, let's go and explore a little bit about the options we have within our policy, and then we'll come back to our, our, our Google email. So the first thing you'll see about a policy is we have the ability to apply a number of controls and rules. So for instance, I might be able to block access to a particular website. Uh, I might be able to allow access uh, to particular content. So just to give you an experience, I mean, clearly I've been to the, uh, um, the BBC website. In this case, um, I might want to restrict people going to eBay because, again, maybe there's no business purpose for them doing that. But we're a pretty relaxed company, so we might say, OK, well, we'll give you a caution. Just make sure you know that we're looking at uh, your content. And here, for example, what we might do is allow you still to get to eBay, but you just obviously are warned that people are looking at your content and your use of the internet. Uh, however, what we might want to do, for example, is maybe also look to uh, block specific content. So you know, maybe gambling doesn't really have a purpose in your business. So what you might do is you might say, I want to block people at getting to gambling websites. But obviously, this is this is pretty basic access control. I mean, I, I think the key point here is is that you can see maybe how we can ensure that people don't go to inappropriate content. But clearly, with applications, it gets a bit more sophisticated. And one of the things we see with Web 2.0 applications, for instance, is the ability to be able to look into actually what's happening in this communications flow, but also being able to do so when encryption is in use. So here, for example, what you'll see is we have a, a number of cloud applications. Maybe we've got Gmail, Outlook, uh, Yahoo, etc. I mean, what we'll do is maybe allow people to view email, maybe send email, but maybe block attachments. And again, if we, if we now drill down into the end user experience, when I compose an email, uh, in this case, maybe I'll, I'll maybe send an email to myself, test as a message, then what I can do is maybe try to upload uh, some content. So in this case, I might upload, for example, a source code. So you'll see in this case, I tried to upload some source code uh, for a, a Python script that I have. 
And you can see the attachment actually failed. Um, now, the reason why it failed was actually because of a policy that I have put in place to make sure that people can use their IT workflow to send information back to themselves. And the reason for that is because clearly if people are using their own personal Hotmail or, or Gmail account to send that content, then once that's sent, unfortunately, then you've got no control over that data. Now, of course, uh, you may wish to say, well, well, couldn't I just copy and paste it into the email? So uh, that may also be true, but uh, let's have a, a look what happens when we allow to send attachments. Because at this point, then, we may need to also look into that content and look at, for example, data loss prevention. So I've just made a, a change now. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow uh, attachments to be sent. So let me just cancel this for one second. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an email again. And this time, I'll send it to myself. I'll do a test. And this time, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow, obviously, to send these transactions. I'm going to send a customer reference. Just wait for that to upload. And this customer reference slide is now, um, is now being sent. Now, one of the key points to note is that Clearly, at this point, I've been able to send that content. It has all of our customer references. Indeed, uh, uh, we can show you what that content looks in a moment. But one of the things we've also done is we've enabled data loss prevention on this particular um, uh, policy. So if we drill into the data loss prevention, you'll see that, for example, uh, I'm actually kicking in uh, a rule that says uh, apply this dictionary and, and engine. Uh, a dictionary is basically a list of, of information we're looking to capture. Um, and we're basically we're combining a number of dictionaries into an engine, and we're applying that engine to basically look into the content to see, is this content containing anything that's sensitive? And if this content is sensitive and it is being sent over a webmail channel, then notify this end user. Uh, this end user happens to be the same person sending the email. And when you do identify this user, you'll see actually we get this uh, DLP violation email that's sent to an auditor. And actually, we can even send the content that was actually uh, being used to exfiltrate that information. So at this point, actually, I could download this customer reference file and I'd be able to see who sent it, what the content was. And this is based on information that we've picked up within the content itself. So if I drill down, for example, into my, my DLP dictionaries and engines, you will see that basically we're just triggering on the, the phrase, this killer confidential and proprietary. So this is a way that I can immediately identify that these end users are, are sending this content. But again, the key point to note is that all of this done, stuff was actually done over an encrypted channel. So again, we had to have SSL interception in order for us to identify this content. So let's have a look at then how do we do SSL inspection? Because we've talked about it from a, a conceptual perspective, but what does that actually look like in practice? So what we have is a set of policies. Um, policies can apply to information uh, that is effectively being sent over SSL. And there are a couple of different, um, I guess, interactions or, or behaviors that one might see on the internet. So the first thing is, is that if you have, for example, SSL decryption enabled, then you can have a couple of different the policy decisions you can apply. The first might be to block undecryptable traffic. So if you've got a communication that's using a, a very funny cipher uh, that cannot be decrypted, then you make, make a decision that actually says, actually, let's block that traffic because we should be using uh, common ciphers uh, and common encryption suites in order for us to be able to uh, look into that traffic. So again, you can control that, but of course you could bypass if needed. You may also make a decision that says actually you may wish to um, say, for example, finance. We're not going to look inside uh, finance uh, transactions or, or communication to finance websites because uh, there may be some sensitivity about what information that may contain. And there might be applications that you wish to not inspect. And again, these might be applications that you decide actually these are trusted or sanctioned applications. And what we'll do is we are prepared um, to bypass those or accept those applications. And again, there might be technical reasons why that may need to be applied, maybe in the case of things like SSL PIN certificates on native clients. And ultimately, then you can make a decision around whether to trust or untrust things like um, certificates, which are uh, not um, I guess validated through the normal um, chain of trust through the certificate chain. And again, you can make a, a policy decision about how and what to do with that traffic. And lastly, for mobile devices like your Apple iPhone or your Android handset, we can deploy a little agent or application onto that device. 
using an enterprise mobility management suite and ultimately allow us to look inside that traffic and again simply allow us to deny uh, that function through the policy. But the key point really just to note is at the bottom of the page because whilst the policy um, is applicable, we still need an ability to be able to manage the keys and manage the certificates about how we look into that traffic. So there are a couple of ways that can be done. The first is you can download a certificate um, from the, the portal. That certificate can then be deployed using things like Active Directory, a group policy, so that all of your endpoints then trust and install that certificate as a trusted CA cert. Uh, alternatively, what you can do is you can generate a certificate signing request. And this certificate signing request will actually then um, be exported. You can then uh, submit that to your own certificate authority if you are running your own PKI in your infrastructure. At that point, what will happen is that the, the certificate will then be generated, will then be trusted, um, so that when the user is presented by the cert, by the Zscaler cloud, because it's signed by your own public key infrastructure, then of course that transaction will be allowed and the browser will trust that, that, that communication. So all of this information, all of this policy can be applied, and again, it's under your control about which websites you wish to apply this to. Uh, but the key point here is that it allows us then to, to go beyond the communications flow and, and be uh, aware and have visibility into these SSL communications. Now, of course, we've shown you one example with uh, data loss prevention. We've shown you an example with um, cloud application control. Uh, but of course, if you're downloading files over the internet, then of course, there may be um, content that is malicious. So in that case, what we may wish to do is run a number of analytics about what that content actually is and have a look at actually what that content may contain. So in the example of um, security, uh, what we may wish to do is drill down, for example, and see if we've downloaded malware over an SSL channel. So in this case, I'm going to jump into the security dashboard. I'm going to have a look at some of the traffic that we're seeing. In this content, we actually have some uh, malware that we've captured. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to look into this malware and see actually what this malware is actually doing. Now, this malware was actually downloaded over an SSL channel. It was actually downloaded uh, from Dropbox. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look into the sandbox report that we can generate. And the sandbox really is a, a virtual cloud offering that allows us to detonate files uh, that we've never seen before. And we need to look into determine and ascertain the behavior of those files. And what we're looking to do is make an assertion of whether this file is actually trying to do something that's legitimate or whether it has some malicious behaviors. And again, uh, without necessarily providing a full down, um, drill down into how cloud sandboxing works, you can see, for example, that um, this particular file is actually a Trojan um, of the Blada Bindi variety. Uh, it's targeted at the Windows platform. And we can see here, for example, it's trying to modify things like the Windows firewall. It's trying to obviously do some DNS queries and do some uh, traffic generation. And indeed, that traffic generation is actually callbacks out to a command and control infrastructure. Uh, if the end user had actually um, downloaded this file, this is actually what they would have seen. Um, so they would have actually seen Office or word opening, we would have seen, for example, some content provided. But actually, you will see it then begins to run uh, some scripts in the background. And that is part of that infection that is effectively installed into that end user's host. And uh, we can see this actual file is aware of the sandbox itself. So it was trying to bypass itself or obfuscate itself from the sandbox. So it was trying to go to sleep for a long time. It was also trying to make a, a number of specific uh, user system calls. Um, but again, part of this was the fingerprinting of this file actually being malicious. So again, it gives you a feel for the fact that not only can we maybe do the interactive communications flow, but the fact that even if content is delivered over SSL, even if it's coming from services such as Dropbox, um, such as we're showing here, um, then we have the ability to detect and identify that malicious content. And lastly, I mean, we did talk a little bit about some of the other capabilities that we, we looked at today. Um, particularly around things like DLP. So uh, if I drill down into the data loss prevention side of things, you know, we can look at where the top violations are coming from. We can then drill down into the logs of exactly what we're seeing in terms of the data loss prevention side of things. And again, we can see here this was my, my Google Mail um, uh, effort to try and uh, obfuscate or hide my behavior uh, by uploading that content via Google Mail. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a flavor and a feel to uh, 
how DivGiller deals with SSL inspection, and just a, a flavor for just some of the access control, the security and threat mitigation that we can provide in conjunction with um, some of the governance and data compliance side of things that we can enforce even if the traffic is actually encrypted. Which brings me back to uh, just maybe a, a little bit of a, a kind of close then on, on today's discussion. So Shona, just uh, one last uh, time, can you just confirm that you can see uh, my presentation, please? Yes, I can. Brilliant. So the way that we, we often um, find a lot of customers who wish to maybe explore a little bit more about what they can do with uh, the security platform that we'll describe today and some of the techniques that we're using is to basically go through a, a three-step journey. So the first thing is because we are actually a cloud platform, you can actually deliver an over-the-top service in conjunction with what you already have deployed today. So what do we mean by that? Well, ultimately what we're doing is effectively just making Zscaler the next hop from what you already have installed. So as your traffic leaves your organization, then what you can do is send it via the Zscaler cloud on its way to the internet. And of course, by doing so, what you do is you allow us to basically apply all of the, the security defense controls that we've described um, in line with that traffic. And the benefit is, is that it basically up-levels your security that you already have in your appliances today. So it's a quick way to do SSL inspection without necessarily, necessarily having to go and deploy any hardware. But of course, if you then use the Zscaler Cloud, the second point is, well, can I actually take advantage of maybe reducing some of the complexity in my environment? And there really it's around the simplification. Uh, you may have proxies, you may have outbound next-gen firewalls, you may have data loss prevention devices. You may be able to make a decision that says, actually, I'm now duplicating some of this functionality. Um, I may be able to remove some of those appliances from my environment, or when those appliances go end of sale or they need refreshed or renewed, it might be more beneficial to use the Zscaler platform to provide that specific function. And of course, maybe if you open a new branch or a new office, Rather than having to go and rebuild that security stack that you have in your headquarters, then again, you could use the Zscaler platform to deliver that functionality. And lastly, um, Zscaler allows you to transform the way you actually build security and deliver a consistent security policy today. And the way we do that is really through network transformation. And today, that's really around the ability to have an office that does not need the the firewalls, the, the proxies, the DLP devices, the sandboxing components, the fact that you can now deliver all this in a cloud service and still provide the most direct connection from those users to those services that they're consuming on the internet, whether it be just web browsing, but also when it comes to things like Office 365, the fact that you can now have local internet breakout without having to rebuild that security stack allows you to transform the way that you can deploy that infrastructure in a way that's never been possible before because we've never had these capabilities at our disposal. And again, that security model allows us to apply not only to the users that are in a, a corporate location, but also in the mobile era when we have users using iPads, phones, laptops, and are traveling, then allowing that posture to also be enforced without having to VPN your traffic back into a central location, which I think for many of us will, will have had generally a bad experience when we use IPsec VPN or SSL VPN uh, as part of our daily workflow. So how do we then maybe help move to the next step? Well, um, the advice would be if you want to see what Zscaler can do to augment your security today, we actually have a tool called Security Preview. And Security Preview will effectively allow you to uh, actually validate and test uh, your, uh, your current infrastructure in a, a safe way. So what it does is effectively it will allow you to run uh, through a web browser a set of uh, or a suite of tests that validate whether you can, for example, um, download potentially malicious content. Could you exfiltrate things like uh, credit card numbers out over your existing internet service? Could you, for example, be subject to a cross-site scripting vulnerability? Is your system secure uh, around making sure that, for example, uh, it wouldn't be susceptible to malware or ransomware? And we can show you all of this uh, in a safe way and provide a report that will tell you the posture assessment of your end device. So I would, and your security stack that you're using to protect that device. 
So I'd highly recommend you to run security preview. Uh, it, it will provide your report. It only takes a few moments to run, and it will give you uh, an assessment of how secure you are today. So with that in mind, uh, that really brings us to uh, the conclusion of this morning's content. Uh, there may be a few questions that may have come in whilst we were going through some of the materials. So, Shona, if I may, I would like to uh, invite you back on and maybe ask uh, if there were any questions uh, from the attendees this morning. Absolutely. Um, so I do have one question. And, um, as things have occurred to you throughout the webinar, um, if you could just take some time to jot down your questions within the questions box, and that would be great. And um, while Andy answers the first question, we'll uh, we'll line them up for him thereafter. Um, so I do have a, um, a question regarding data privacy. Um, obviously, with the new EU general data protection regulation um, hitting the headlines and people thinking about planning and looking at data privacy, um, how does SSL inspection and decryption of all traffic sit with that? Um, are there any data privacy issues in terms of inspecting all encrypted traffic? So that point is actually one that we commonly see. So there are a couple of different ways to interpret that. So from a privacy perspective, um, first of all, compliant with the, the GDPR regulation itself, uh, as of May 2018. However, um, if we think about the information that we collect about end users and their, their interaction with the internet, then one of the things we can do, for instance, is apply a, a four eyes principle to the content. So that makes sure that people or administrators cannot see uh, user names or uh, the identity of the users who are actually using the internet and what they've been looking at, uh, unless they have been particularly sanctioned or granted uh, special privileges or access by uh, uh, you know, a second uh, administrator or maybe a HR uh, representative. So the benefit there is we tokenize and we anonymize all the username information as it goes through the service. And that means that uh, it gives that level of assurance that you know, people aren't necessarily uh, being subject to that information being analyzed by admins. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, when it comes to uh, specific content and specific sites, there is also the ability to apply policy to see what content is actually inspected. So you know, quite often we will see organizations put policies in that ensures that any access to healthcare websites, uh, for instance, is not inspected, just to give their end users confidence that absolutely that there is no way that that traffic could ever be inspected. Now a key point to note about Zscaler is that we never actually capture the actual uh, content payloads itself. Uh, what we're actually recording is metadata about who looked at what, but not actually what that content was. So from that perspective, we're, not, we're never holding any of that information about what was actually downloaded or looked at from a, 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 a privacy perspective. But if we look at the other side of the coin is how can Zscaler help ensure that a company is uh, compliant with GDPR, then a lot of this is around improving the overall security, posture, and hygiene with a company. And really, that is the intent of the, the general data protection regulation. And in particular, if we think about some of the data loss prevention controls, the ability to, for example, make sure that we can uh, block or uh, be notified if somebody tries to upload um, potentially content that might contain personal, personally identifiable information. The ability, for example, to make sure the end users don't get compromised with malware that could ultimately re result in a data breach. Um, those types of, of protection mechanisms are actually native to the platform itself. And indeed, we're having a lot of conversations right now with our end customers about how they can use and employ Zscaler as part of an overall security architecture to, to be compliant with, with the principles behind uh, the general data protection regulation. So hopefully that answers that particular question. But those are a, a, just a couple of points maybe uh, that commonly come up when it comes to, to those, uh, those facts. Okay, thank you, Andy. I don't have any additional questions from the audience at the moment, so I'd just like to 
take the time to thank Andy very much for his detailed presentation and his time this morning and thank everyone for attending today's session. I appreciate everyone has very busy diaries so that the fact that you're taking time to have a look at this is, is really appreciated and we hope you found today useful. Um, I do reiterate that we have a recording of the session which I will circulate to people post-session along with Andy's slides from his presentation and please do take a couple of minutes just to fill in the um, quick feedback survey at the end. Thank you very much everyone and good morning.